My passion for education <clears throat> has been uh, education as a use for going very far from what a human being is at birth and very far what a human being is from a traditional culture to what a human being can be from taking on these elevated points of view. So schooling uh, is not found in any formal way in most uh, traditional societies because most of the things that need to be learned are learned by watching what the adults do and there are some little secret society things that are special schooling for boys and girls in many societies but the kind of formal schooling we're used to actually got uh, created along with writing because surprisingly enough and it's still a surprise today when you think about it even though writing especially our form of alphabetic writing is nothing much more than writing down the very sounds that we make most people when they speak are not even aware they're making speech sounds they think in terms of words and sentences and so writing was actually a hard invention we were on the planet for about 190,000 years before writing was invented. It's shocking. And once it was invented, particularly when we move forward to alphabetic writing, one of the things that was surprising was, uh, hey, it's still hard to learn. And so schools were set up to help learn this thing, which now is looked at as much more of a skill learning than what it takes for us to learn our native language or learn stories that are being being told and as schooling progressed we had other inventions so we had the inventions of mathematics uh, around 2500 BC and I've been talking about science but the other thing that happened in the 17th and 18th century was inventions of new forms of governance that tried to deal with some of the ideas of what's the trade-off between what's owed to the society and what's owed to the individual. And all of these ideas are actually very hard for uh, most human brains to actually think about and learn. The idea of equal rights, for instance, is not found in any traditional society ever studied by anthropologists. And there are some that have something a little more like equal rights, but uh, they, they almost never apply to women. And so this idea of equal rights is actually an invention. It's not something we're born with, and it is actually hard to learn. It's ha hard to put into practice. And so the, when education was set up, uh, particularly the parts that Thomas Jefferson had to do with and also in uh, <clears throat> New England, colonies was set up primarily to teach uh, people who are mostly agrarian farmers uh, how to read, how to learn from reading, uh, what the main issues of government are and not how to agree to a party line because diversity is the very soul of freedom but how to argue with others to make progress rather than to just win. And all of these things were part of the larger sphere of how this country was set up. So the one of the biggest things that helped democracy along was the printing press. And Marshall McLuhan pointed out, he said, you can argue with a lot about a lot of things with stained glass windows but democracy is not one of them. And our country was literally argued into existence through writing and especially through printing. And many people are not aware of it, but even during the Constitutional Convention, when drafts were done, well, there were between 30 and 55 people there at any given time. When a draft was done, how did all of them read it? And the answer is, was typeset overnight and printed 
the copies for everybody were printed before the session started each day when they had something to go. And there are some of these uh, interesting drafts in typeset, types printed in a narrow column, so there's plenty of room for writing notes on them. So this idea of being able to send out ideas and send out a few facets of an idea, and then having people be able to debate these ideas and then to find some accommodation is part and parcel of uh, why the United States has survived and prospered for so long. So my interest uh, when we started thinking about personal computers and in fact, to invent personal computers, <clears throat> both in the Advanced Research Projects Agency funding in the 60s and then Xerox PARC in the 70s. Part of the idea was the personal computer, if we could do it, is not just something that can deal with old media, but it can actually deal with ideas and especially new ideas in ways that old media can't. And in particular, if you think about some of the things <clears throat> that we're worried about today, they're all processes. We're not so worried about a single idea that's just sitting there. We're worrying about global warming. There's the population explosion. There are uh, the ability to make extremely powerful weapons for human beings who still have these cave people brains. That's all of us. And so uh, one of the things that mathematics was invented for was to be able to do thinking about time and space without having to make things, where you were making lightweight things made out of symbols and if your theories were good, the mathematics would do a lot of the work of making mistakes out in the real world. And the computers can go much, much further than that in roughly the same way. And much of what we know about global warming is actually due to computer simulations of many different kinds. It's a very complicated area. And so an interesting question is, we used to teach children reading for very good reasons, and most of them not having to do with getting a job, but for getting into the issues of our time. So I got interested in the idea, and I was catalyzed by Seymour Papert, uh, of inventing personal computing along with some colleagues in order to put children into the most important ideas of our time using the most powerful modes of expression. And, uh, well, it hasn't really happened. We actually have the computers. We I worked on the, the computer that uh, about 11 years later became the first Macintosh. And a bunch of us worked on uh, the networks, large and small, that we use today. And a number of us worked on laser printing, and a number of us worked on many other parts of this thing. Um, I actually designed the early fonts, uh, some of the descendants of which are used by people who read ebooks today. And but in fact, we weren't doing these things in order to imitate old media. We were doing things to try to change the educational system to make the ideas more powerful, to make the ways of learning them uh, sink much deeper into the way children think. And the ideal <clears throat> was to have as many children as possible grow up thinking much, much better than most adults do today. So that doesn't happen, <clears throat> and I think it will. But what we're doing right now, because of the way companies work and consumer products work, is computers are being used primarily as something that is not only directly television, but things that are like television. 
That is, they're being used for old media, they're being used for old ideas, they're being used for things that every cave person would rec recognize. But they're almost never being used for things that no cave person would recognize, like learning about how cooperation completely trumps competition and better ways to balance these ideas so that the resources available are much, much larger for all. So all of these ideas uh, have been thought about for many, many years. But if you think about looking forward to a future we'd like to live in, then the best way to predict the future uh, would be to invent it. That's going to be on my tombstone, I think. But the future we want to invent is a future in which human beings have finally grown up into real adults rather than the half-adults that we have today. Thank you very much. <laughs>